only in the live room tracking session video today do we have the bland in common Alex G. We're also going to be featuring the infamous, the great, the one and only John Mullen. <laughs> All right, all apologies to Alex. That was kind of uncalled for, but we are going to do a live room tracking session today that you all seem to enjoy. And this time, we're going to do something a little extra, and we're going to bring it into the mixing room, and we're going to break down some tracks individually from there. I think you're going to like this new format. I think we're going to learn even more, and I think you're going to understand how to mix a little better. And what makes the tracking session so special today, and I think something that we could learn from, is that I'm going to be tracking live vocals and live acoustic guitar in a very folksy type of setting with live drums practically 10 feet away from those microphones. So that is going to make things really difficult for me as a recording engineer. And going into, the, I, going into this, I was really unsure how the end result was going to end up because of that situation. There's no isolation. I don't have any gobo structures or anything like that. But in the end, I actually really liked how it came out, and hopefully we can all learn a thing or two by the end of this video. Now, normally in a regular recording studio, when you're in a situation like this where you're going to be tracking acoustic guitar live with drums, you're either going to put the acoustic guitar in some sort of isolation booth, or you could just have some sort of electric pickup inside the acoustic guitar. And that was actually an option for me today. Um, Alex had a one of those pickups that you slide in the sound hole that picks up the electric guitar. I could have done that. I could have just plugged that straight into the mixing board, made something work. But honestly, I really wanted to challenge myself. And two, you know, to me, there's just nothing like the sound of acoustic guitar. And the way John plays with his fingers, it's just so folksy. It just didn't seem quite right to plug it in electrically. So I, I kind of just went full throttle into making this uh, a little more difficult than it needed to be. All right, let's make our way over to the mixing board so I could break down all of the microphones that we set up. And then we'll start going through the mix down. All right, hopefully I gave you a little bit of an intro there. Uh, we're going to do a little something different th uh, in this video today, and I hope it turns out well because I think we're going to have some fun today, and I think you guys are going to learn a thing or two. So, let's quickly go over the tracks that I have recorded for this song that is called Hey Is Mean that the boy John Mullen had written. So, on track one, we have the main drum microphone. It is my shiny box ribbon microphone. It is about maybe three or so feet in front of my drum kit. Now this is ribbon microphone, so it's a figure eight pickup pattern. And you know, it's going to be picking up some sound coming from the living room live area where Alex and John will be sitting. But you know, the sound is going to be so overpowered by the, or the rib, the microphone is going to be so overpowered by the drums that I don't think it's really going to be affected by anything going on remotely in that room. The second microphone is the snare microphone, and uh, <clears throat> my go-to is the EV635A omnidirectional dynamic microphone. If you guys know me, you know that's my favorite dynamic microphone. Um, that's like a standard for me on the snare. I think it gives a pretty good picture of the whole kit, mostly snare, but it gives you some tom sound if I hit some toms. Um, gives me a little bit of everything, gives really good uh, sound on the hi-hats as well because it's so close the way I position it. Um, and I'm actually sending that through a Bogan power amplifier as kind of like a little bit of a color box. I, sometimes I like to crank a snare through that Bogan PA amp. On track number three, we have Alex G on bass. And normally I never DI a bass, but since today I knew I was going to be dealing with a bunch of room noise and I had John's vocal mic and acoustic guitar mic right next to basically where the bass amp is, I figured, let's just DI that son's bitch. So, the bass is completely DI'd for this song, and I actually really like how it came out, so maybe it's something I will explore in the future. On <clears throat> track number four, which is actually here because this channel is a little fagazy, on track number four, we have uh, John's acoustic guitar microphone. This is an uh, Electric Voice RE10 microphone, and I have that uh, pointed right at the uh, bridge of his acoustic guitar. That is a hypercardioid microphone, 
and I'm hoping just to kind of reject some of the sound swirling in the room with that microphone. On track number five, this is John's vocal mic, and once again, I'm using an EV635 omnidirectional dynamic microphone here, and I specifically chose the omnidirectional microphone because the gain was going to have to be pretty high for me to capture his vocals um, as well as I needed to, and... You know, I was hoping that the omnidirectional pickup pattern was going to um, treat the sound that is just reverberating in the room better than a uh, cardioid microphone would. You know, there's no off-axis coloration with the omnidirectional microphone, so when I start applying massive amounts of compression and stuff like that, and the drum sound really starts coming through that microphone, it's not going to negatively mix with the two drum microphones I have specifically for the drums. It should theoretically mix a little better because the EQ should be a little more even. And then the last two tracks um, were not part of the live room setup. Those first five microphones were all part of the live room setup. Uh, on track number six, I took, once again, my EV635A, put it right next to my reed organ. I cut uh, uh, the frequencies that... Um, we're causing a lot of hum, and basically that was it. Didn't think too much about it. I knew the reed organ was going to be low in the mix, so I didn't go crazy micing it up. I kind of just stuck it there, uh, kind of notch filtered the problem frequencies where there was a lot of hum and called it a day. On track number seven, um, this was like a last minute thought for the song. Um, I kept hearing an electric guitar part as I was mixing down the song. And I just kept hearing it in my head, and I'm like, finally, I'm like, let me just throw it in there. I got pretty close to what I was hearing in my head, and you will hear that once the song comes out. Now, all of this while I'm mixing down is going through a master bus compressor, my Ashley compressor here. I have a ratio of three. I have the attack time all the way to the slow slowest setting and the release time all the way to the fastest setting. That's kind of like my standard setup when it comes to master bus compression. I don't really fall through too much in that. The only thing I really change is the ratio, and that's completely um, dependent on uh, the song material at hand. A couple other things I forgot to add when I was going through the live tracking situation is that for the DI bass, while we were tracking, I was sending that through my 160X compressor at a ratio of 6 to 1, and for the vocal mic, I was sending that to my Shure microphone mixer, and I specifically was sending it to the Shure microphone mixer because I know uh, in the past when John has sung on a couple of songs that we recorded that he starts really soft, and then he'll just start belting out his vocal lines when the um, kind of the big climax of the song comes in, and you know that uh, Shure microphone mixer does a really good job of kind of taking care of those really loud signals it saturates really nice it doesn't sound ugly to a certain degree so um when i know that john's going to be belting like that i like to use that shore microphone mixer now i could now you like i could have put a compressor on the vocal track um when i was tracking which is normally what i do i like to put some moderate compression at least a nine to uh or i'm sorry a four to one um, sometimes a six to one on the vocals when I'm tracking and then if needed, I'll add more from there when I'm mixing down. But since I knew I was going to be getting a lot of drum sound in that vocal microphone and as well as the acoustic guitar in that microphone, I wasn't quite sure how much compression that was going to need. So I waited until the mix down stage to do all the compression on the vocals. Now, while I was mixing down... Um, I was making full use of my auxiliary sense here. I, w I had one channel for the reverb, which I was just kind of randomly throwing the seven different tracks to that reverb send. Um, I don't really remember when I actually did the mix down for the song, you know, the specifics of what tracks were being sent where. Uh, I think I set up the board uh, today pretty close to where I had it. And then I also have a second track for reverb this time that uh second channel for reverb which is both these are coming out of my fostex uh reverb unit over here there's two channels there so that's where i'm getting the two channels from that second channel i am sending that vocal mic through a compressor 
Um, I'm using a compression ratio of 5 to 1. Um, a pretty moderate attack time and a fast release time. Sending it through that compressor and then sending that to the Fostec reverb. Um, this time, I'm letting the dry signal and the wet signal to come out full blast. And, you know, that's, that's kind of acting as the main uh, reverb just for the vocal mic. Uh, my third auxiliary send is my parallel compression for the drums. Um, I, I, I'm always using parallel compression on my mix downs for the drums. Nothing fancy going on there. I am limiting that parallel compression. Really slow attack time, really fast release time. Um, if you haven't, if you can't tell by now, I like to really use slow attack times on my compressors and fast release times on my compressors. Um, honestly, I really don't fall, uh, I really don't change much from that. I, I will occasionally uh, fasten that attack time, but really that release time, I kind of barely touch for all my compressors, and that's completely dependent on the compressors I have. They're all very transparent sounding compressors, and that just seems to work best for my setup and sound. Now, the fourth auxiliary send, <clears throat> this was kind of like a last minute decision, and I, I don't even think it was that necessary, but what I wound up doing was sending the acoustic guitar microphone that's pointed at the bridge of the acoustic guitar. I'm sending that through my 160x compressor, a ratio of 4 to 1, I believe. No, I'm sorry. Uh, ratio of 6 to 1. And I'm really just trying to kind of bring the acoustic guitar out a little more because once the whole band kicks in and the drums kick in, it really gets lost in the mix and... This was my attempt at trying to salvage that as much as possible. Unfortunately, because the drum sound is in that microphone, um, you know, I I'm also compressing the drum signal with that. So it's not perfect. You'll kind of hear that once I start playing uh, the song. Now, normally I leave the final result to the end of the video, but I think it's going to make most sense if I play the final result of the song before we start soloing. Um, specific tracks and listening to them independently and this final mix down you're going to hear is um it's not going to be from today it's from when i did it about a week ago i was mixing everything down to my quarter inch tape machine there and then when i uh when i was doing my mastering stage uh quote unquote there i'm playing back uh my mix down i'm setting it through my parametric equalizer just boosting a couple frequencies and then I am limiting it a uh, very minor degree, maybe about 2 dB, 3 dB. Um, so let's take a listen to that now. I see another picture of the real. I see the other with no choice but to me.
All right, hopefully you liked how that sounded. When we were tracking that song, I was really skeptical because John um, was writing it on the spot, and me and Alex were having such a hard time following along, and... It's like it's a half verse, and then there's another half verse, and then there's kind of a whole verse, but it, it falls short. It goes, uh... <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> oh, what the f***? That final take actually came out really good. You know, John's vocals always really shine through, and um, they often carry the songs that we record with him. Uh, he has a really good natural singing voice. All right. So I'm going to do my best here to kind of, you know, do uh, p play through the final mix here, and I will try to synchronize the video somewhere here while we're playing along because I know... Your goddamn TikTok generation out there needs 20,000 visuals to keep interested in the video. So, um, normally I don't do mix downs with headphones either. I like to use the monitors I have in the room, but since we're recording with this microphone, I'm using headphones. I don't know why I'm mentioning it. I'm kind of just talking loud. All right, let's just shut up and start listening to the song. All right, so I actually just recorded that whole thing and realized that I had something not set up right on the mixing board and I was wondering why it sounded like shit the whole time so I'm gonna have to redo this and hopefully second time is the charm so the first thing I want to do is listen to the uh, John's microphones the acoustic microphone and the vocal microphone so let's start from the beginning and let's just start with his acoustic guitar microphone straight from the microphone Let's add his vocal microphone. Slight phasing. Not enough to hurt anyone. Let's listen to just the vocal mic. Light a candle for your lovers, shed a tear. And you're gonna hear uh, the vocal mic get a little nasty when he pushes it hard through that sure microphone mixer. Go walking through the stores of death and trying to live your life. But this far. Now you start to hear the drums through both these microphones. Right now it's not too bad. I mean, you can hear how much the drums are coming through. That acoustic microphone, what about the vocal microphone? Was it worth the way to try and live your life? Came to see how it came to be out, and they never feel it. But you say then You walk on by all the stars and sky and try to live your life. I mean, that acoustic guitar microphone really gets lost. Let's just mute it. Mute it. I can't even hear it towards the end. All right, now uh, I want to listen to that same acoustic microphone uh, with the compression and compare it just the microphone and then with compression. And something to always keep in mind is that when you're solo, you, when you're adding compression to a track, you really don't want to listen to it soloed because soloing, uh, adding compression when you're soloing a track gives you no frame of reference of how that track is going to sound with the rest of the instrumentation. And that's, you know, why you're adding compression in the first place is you want to tame the dynamics so it fits better in a mix. So when I solo through it, um, you're probably thinking, wow, that, that microphone channel alone without any compression added sounds better than the compressed track, but really, uh, it's just because there's more dynamics there and that alone is going to sound better, but in order, like I said, to get it sound better in the mix, compression squashes that dynamic range and so you could lift up the volume a little bit so it gets heard in the mix a little better. I see another picture of the I see the just the microphone. And 
I'm really only adding a little bit of uh, EQ here. I'm really just adding a little high end just because uh, he's using his fingers to no pick. And a little bit of body. Listen to the drums now. So this is the front of kick ribbon microphone. Um, not much going on right now because it's just the hi-hat, but if I add in the parallel compression, it really brings that up. Once again, just the ribbon uh, front of kick front of kit microphone. Let's take the EQ off. Sounds really flat as is. What about the snare microphone? This really sounds like crap alone. Let's take the EQ off. Yikes. EQ on both drum microphones. Sounds better. Let's add the parallel compression. Now we're... Off. I mean, that parallel compression adds a lot to the mix. Um, let's quickly listen to that again, and I'm going to mute the parallel compression with the whole mix uh, going, and let's see if we could, what differences we could hear. So, that parallel compression really brings out the hi-hat feel here. Without it. that read microphone. there you really hear it drone on yeah all right all right now let's listen to that vocal microphone this is just the pure microphone I see the other with no choice but to kneel. now with the effects added Compression off. Cause when they say it's done, every daughter and son's got nowhere to hide. Way more dynamic. Go walking through the stairs of death and trying to live your life. But this wrong. With compression. And when they come to do what they said they do, I know. With the mix. So this is DI based. This lady queuing off. I couldn't really hear this during the session, but upon playback, I think Alex did a perfect job of keeping it subdued and it fits perfectly in the song. Mute it. See how much this song loses when I mute it? Bass is so important to a mix.
Let's take a quick listen to the lead guitar now. Something I forgot if I mentioned already, but that electric guitar track, I'm actually not playing straight from the uh, this channel. I'm sending that through the same path that I'm sending the vocal microphone through. So I'm sending it through my compressor and then through the reverb with the dry and wet signal, both at full blast. And um, I did that because I really wanted it to sit far back in the mix. I really didn't want to uh, it to overpower anything. It was really not to really detract your attention. So I'm going to switch through playing it without any compression or reverb added and then play it just with the microphone. I want to hear the difference. Yeah, so adding compression to that guitar uh, signal and, and and then some reverb, I think, made it get pushed back in the mix. I think it fits the vibe a lot more better. And um, uh, let's listen to the effect that the master bus compressor is going to have on the final mix. <laughs> Hopefully I did a good job kind of level matching the comparison because once I took the compressor off, the levels just go really high and it just sounds better because it's louder. So I tried to level match there so you can kind of hear the difference. Um, I think that's it. Uh, hopefully I didn't screw up too much here. Hopefully you kind of like this format. I swear to God the first time I recorded this and did this video, it sounded so much better. I was so much more fluid, but um, I'll get better. Uh, fucking kill me. What are you gonna do? I don't get fucking paid for this shit. All right. Uh, let's go back to my narrator voice because I'm a little more calm there. All right. All right. My narrator voice is back. What do you guys think? Did you learn something? Did you like it? Did you th How do you think this song sounded? Put down in the comments what you think about the song. Honestly, I'm more than happy with the way it came out. When we first started the session and I was challenging myself to have the acoustic in the same you know, room as the drums, I'm like, there's no way this is going to turn out good. And if you solo any of the microphones, you're probably going to think, wow, this is going to sound like total shit. But when you put everything together, put a little compression on, son of a bitch, slap way too much reverb, it all kind of just mends together and kind of fits well with one another. And when you do kind of a live session like this where there's all these microphones in the same recording space, you're always going to have to think about how the phasing is going to interact from one microphone to another. And as I've explained in many of my videos, uh, that's kind of why I like to use omnidirectional microphones as much as possible. Not necessarily for the phasing issues, but because they don't have off-axis coloration. So when you combine these with other microphones, you're not combining uh, signal sources that sound completely different from one another. And I think that is going to be it for today. What do you guys think about these live mixing type of videos? Are they interesting? Maybe next video I do something where I take a song completely 
uh, from scratch that was tracked and I mix it in real time and tell you kind of the, uh, some of the decisions I make. And I don't know, maybe that'll be interesting. Let me know what you guys think. I will see you all next fortnight. Peace. Yo. Previously on live room tracking with friends. My aunt is very sick.